Hello, welcome to another First Chapter Friday. Our special treat today is New York Times bestselling author and the New York Times bestselling book turned into a movie, probably put this author on the map, and that is The Fault in Our Stars. The book is by John Green. It starts with an introductory, a quote from a fictional book that is important to this story. As the tide washed in, the Dutch tulip man faced the ocean. Conjurer, rejoinder, poisoner, concealer, revelator. Look at it, rising up and rising down, taking everything with it. What's that? I asked. Water, the Dutch man said. Well, and time. That's by Peter Van Houten, An Imperial Affliction. Chapter One. Late in the winter of my 17th year, my mother decided I was depressed. Presumably because I had rarely left the house, spent quite a lot of time in bed, read the same book over and over, ate infrequently, and devoted quite a bit of my abundant free time to thinking about death. Whenever you read a cancer booklet or website or whatever, they always list depression among the side effects of cancer. But in fact, depression is not a side effect of cancer. Depression is a side effect of dying. Cancer is also a side effect of dying. Almost everything is really. But my mom believed I required treatment. So she took me to see my regular Dr. Jim, who agreed that I was veritably swimming in a paralyzing and totally clinical depression and that therefore my meds should be adjusted and also I should attend a weekly support group. This support group featured a rotating cast of characters in various states of tumor-driven unwellness. Why did the cast rotate? A side effect of dying. The support group, of course, was depressing as hell. It met every Wednesday in the basement of a stone-walled Episcopal church shaped like a cross. We all sat in a circle right in the middle of the cross, where the two boards would have met, where the heart of Jesus would have been. I noticed this because Patrick, the support group leader, and the only person over 18 in the room, he talked about the heart of Jesus every freaking meeting all about how we, as young cancer survivors, were sitting right in Christ's very sacred heart and whatever. So here's how it went in God's heart. The six or seven or ten of us walked wheeled in, grazed at a decrepit selection of cookies and lemonade, sat down in the circle of trust and listened to Patrick recount for the thousandth time his depressing, miserable life story how he had had cancer in his balls, and they thought he was going to die, but he didn't die. And now here he is, a full-grown adult in church, in a basement of the 137th nicest city in America, divorced, addicted to video games, mostly friendless, eking out a meager living by exploiting his cancerotic past, slowly working his way toward a master's degree that will not improve his career prospects, waiting, as we all do, for the sword of Damocles to give him the relief that he escaped lo those many years ago when cancer took both of his nuts but spared what only the most generous soul would call his life. And you too might be so lucky. Then we introduced ourselves, age, diagnosis, and how we were doing today. I'm Hazel, I'd say, when they get to me, 16, Thyroid originally, but with an impressive and long, settled satellite colony in my lungs. And I'm doing okay. Once we got around the circle, Patrick always asked if anyone wanted to share. And then began the circle jerk of support. Everyone talking about fighting and battling and winning and shrinking and scanning. To be fair to Patrick, he let us talk about dying too. But most of them weren't dying. Most would live into adulthood as Patrick had, which meant there was quite a lot of competitiveness about it, with everyone wanting to beat not only cancer itself, but also the other people in the room. 
Like I realize this is irrational, but when they tell you what they have, say a 20% chance of living five years, the math kicks in and you figure that's only one of five. So you look around and you think, as any healthy person would, I gotta outlast four of these baths. You know, the B word. The only redeeming facet of the support group was this kid named Isaac. A long-faced, skinny guy with straight blonde hair swept over one eye. And his eyes were the problem. He had some fantastically improbable eye cancer. One eye had been cut out when he was a kid, and now he wore the kind of thick glasses that made his eyes, both the real one and the glass one, preternaturally huge, like his whole head was basically just this fake eye and this real eye staring at you. From what I could gather on the rare occasions when Isaac shared with the group, a reoccurrence had his remaining eye in mortal peril. Isaac and I communicated almost exclusively through sighs. Each time someone discussed an anti-cancer diet or snorting ground up shark fin or whatever, he'd glance over at me and sigh ever so slightly. I'd shake my head microscopically and exhale in response. So support group blew, and after a few weeks, I grew to be rather kicking and screaming about the whole affair. In fact, on the Wednesday that I made the acquaintance of Augustus Waters, I tried my level best to get out of support group while sitting on a couch with my mom in the third leg of our 12-hour marathon of the previous season's America's Top Model, which admittedly I had already seen, but still. Me. I refused to attend support group. Mom. One of the symptoms of depression is disinterest in activities. Me. Please just let me watch America's Next Top Model. It's an activity. Mom, television is a passivity. Me, ugh, mom, please. Mom, Hazel, you're a teenager. You're not a little kid anymore. You need to make friends, get out of the house, and live your life. Me, if you want me to be a teenager, don't send me to support group. Find me a fake idea so I can go clubbing and drink vodka and take pot. Mom, you don't take pot, for starters. Me. See, that's the kind of thing I'd know if you got me a fake ID. Mom, you're going to support group. Me, ugh. Mom, Hazel, you deserve a life. That shut me up. Although I failed to see how attendance at a support group met the definition of life. Still, I agreed to go after negotiating the right to record 1.5 episodes of ANTM that I'd be missing. I went to support group for the same reason I'd once allowed nurses with a mere 18 months of graduate education to poison me with exotically named chemicals. I wanted to make my parents happy. There is only one thing in the world crappier, but he used the S word, than biting it from cancer when you're 16. And that's having a kid who has cancer. Mom pulled into a circular driveway behind the church at 4.56. I pretended to fiddle with my oxygen tank for a second, just to kill time. Do you want me to carry that in for you? No, it's fine, I said. The cylindrical green tank only weighed a few pounds, and I had this little steel cart to wheel it around behind me. It delivered two liters of oxygen to me each minute through a canula, a transparent tube that split just beneath my neck, wrapped around my ears, and then reunited in my nostrils. The contraption was necessary because my lungs sucked at being lungs. I love you, she said as I got out. You too, Mom. See you at six. Make friends, she said through the roll-down window as I walked away. I didn't want to take the elevator because taking the elevator is a last day's kind of activity at support group. So I took the stairs. I grabbed a cookie and poured some lemonade into a Dixie cup and then turned around. A boy was staring at me. I was quite sure I'd never seen him before. Long, leanly muscular, he dwarfed the molded plastic elementary school chair he was sitting in. 
Mahogany hair, straight and short. He looked about my age, maybe a year older, and he sat with his tailbone against the edge of the chair, his posture aggressively poor, one hand half in a pocket of dark jeans. I looked away, suddenly conscious of my myriad insufficiencies. I was wearing old jeans, which had once been tight but now sagged in weird places, and a yellow t-shirt advertising a band I didn't even like anymore. Also my hair. I had this page boy haircut, and I hadn't even bothered to, like, brush it. Furthermore, I had ridiculously fat, chipmunked cheeks. A side effect of treatment, I look like a normally proportioned person with a balloon for a head. This was not even to mention the cankle situation. And yet, I cut a glance to him, and his eyes were still on me. It occurred to me why they call it eye contact. I walked into the circle and I sat down next to Isaac, two seats away from the boy. I glanced again. He was still watching me. Look, let me just say it. He was hot. A non-hot boy staring at you relentlessly and it is at best awkward and at worst a form of assault, but a hot boy, mm, well. I pulled out my phone and clicked it so it would display the time. 4.59. The circle filled in with the unlucky 12 to 18s. And then Patrick started us out with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change, the courage to change things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The guy was still staring at me, and I felt rather blushy. Finally, I decided that the proper strategy was to stare back. Boys do not have a monopoly on the staring business, after all. So I looked him over as Patrick acknowledged for the thousandth time his ballessness, etc. And soon it was a staring contest. After a while, the boy smiled. And then finally, his blue eyes glanced away. When he looked back at me, I flicked my eyebrows up to say, I win. He shrugged. Patrick continued, and then finally it was time for the introductions. Isaac, perhaps you'd like to go first today. I know you're facing a challenging time. Yeah, Isaac said. I'm Isaac. I'm 17. And it's looking like I have to get surgery in a couple weeks, after which I'll be blind. Not to complain or anything, because I know a lot of us have it worse, but yeah. I mean... Being blind does sort of suck. My girlfriend helps, though, and friends like Augustus. He nodded toward the boy, who now had a name. So yeah, Isaac continued. He was looking at his hands, which he had folded into each other like the top of a teepee. There's uh, nothing you can do about it. We're here for you, Isaac, Patrick said. Let Isaac hear it, guys. And then we all, in a monotone, said, We're here for you, Isaac. Michael was next. He was 12. He had leukemia. He always had leukemia. He was okay, or so he said. He'd taken the elevator. Lydia was 16, and pretty enough to be the object of the hot boy's eye. She was a regular, in long remission from appendicitical cancer, which I had not previously known existed. She said, as she said every other time I'd attended support group, that she felt strong, which felt like bragging to me as the oxygen dribbling nubs tickled my nostrils. There were five others before they got to him. He smiled a little when his turn came. His voice was low, smoky, and dead sexy. My name is Augustus Waters, he said. I'm 17. I had a little touch of osteosarcoma last year and a half ago, but I'm just here today at Isaac's request. And how are you feeling? asked Patrick. Oh, I'm grand. Augustus Waters smiled with a corner of his mouth. I'm on a roller coaster that only goes up, my friend. When it was my turn, I said, my name is Hazel, I'm 16, thyroid with mets in my lungs, I'm okay. The hour proceeded apace. Fights were recounted, battles won amid wars, 
sure to be lost. Hope was clung to. Families were both celebrated and announced. It was agreed that friends just didn't get it. Tears were shed. Comfort proffered. Neither Augustus Waters nor I spoke again until Patrick said, Augustus, perhaps you'd like to share your fears with the group. My fears? Yes. I fear oblivion. He said without a moment's pause. I feel it like the proverbial blind man who's afraid of the dark. Too soon, Isaac said, cracking a smile. Was that insensitive? Augustus asked. I can be pretty blind to other people's feelings. Isaac was laughing, but Patrick raised a chastening finger and said, Augustus, please, let's return to you and your struggles. You said you fear oblivion? I did, Augustus answered. Patrick seemed lost. Would, uh, would anyone like to speak to that? I hadn't been in proper school in three years. My parents were my two best friends. My third best friend was an author who didn't even know I existed. I was a fairly shy person, not the hand-raising type. And yet, just this once, I decided to speak. I half raised my hand into Patrick. His delight evident immediately said, Hazel! I was, I'm sure he assumed, opening up, becoming part of the group. I looked over at Augustus Waters, who looked back at me. You could almost see through his eyes. They were so blue. There will come a time, I said, when all of us are dead. All of us. There will come a time when there are no human beings remaining to remember that anyone ever existed or that our species ever did anything. There will be no one left to remember Aristotle or Cleopatra, let alone you. Everything that we did and built and wrote, thought and discovered will be forgotten and all of this, I gestured encompassingly, will have been for naught. Maybe that time is coming soon and maybe it's millions of years away, but even if we survive the collapse of our sun, we will not survive forever. There was a time before organisms experienced consciousness and there will be a time after. And if the inevitability of human oblivion worries you, I encourage you to ignore it. God knows that's what everyone else does. I'd learned this from my aforementioned third best friend, Peter Van Houten, the reclusive author of An Imperial Affliction, the book that was as close a thing as I had ever had to a Bible. Peter Van Houten was the only person I'd ever come across who seemed to a understand what it's like to be dying and b not have died. After I finished, there was quite a long period of silence as I watched a smile spread all the way across Augustus's face. Not the little crooked smile of a boy trying to be sexy while he stared at me, but his real smile, too big for his face. God, Augustus said quietly, aren't you something else? Neither of us said anything for the rest of support group. At the end, we all had to hold hands and Patrick led us in a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we are gathered here in your heart, literally in your heart as cancer survivors. You and you alone know us as we know ourselves. Guide us to life and the light throughout our times of trial. We pray for Isaac's eye and Michael's and Jamie's blood, for Augustus's bones, for Hazel's lungs, and for James's throat. We pray that you might heal us and that we may feel your love, your peace, which passes all understanding. And we remember in our hearts those whom we knew and loved who have gone home to you. Maria and Cade and Joseph and Haley and Abigail and Angelina and Gabriel and Taylor and it was a long list. The world contains a lot of dead people and while Patrick droned on reading the list from a sheet of paper because it was too long to memorize, I kept my eyes closed, trying to think prayerfully but mostly imagining the day when my name would find its way onto that list. All the way at the end, when everyone had stopped listening. When Patrick was finished, we said this stupid mantra together, living our best life today, and it was over. 
Augustus Waters pushed himself out of his chair and walked over to me. His gait was crooked like his smile. He towered over me, but he kept his distance so I wouldn't have to crane my neck to look him in the eye. What's your name? He asked. Hazel. No, your full name. Uh, Hazel Grace Lancaster? He was just about to say something else when Isaac walked up. Hold on, Augustus said, raising a finger and turning to Isaac. <laughs> that was actually worse than you made it out to be. I told you it was bleak. Why do you even bother with it? I don't know. It kind of helps. Augustus leaned in so he thought I couldn't hear. Is she a regular? I couldn't hear Isaac's comment, but Augustus responded, I'll say. He clasped Isaac by both shoulders and then took a half a step away from him. Tell Hazel about the clinic. Isaac leaned a hand against the snack table and focused his huge eye on me. Okay, so I went into clinic this morning and I was telling my surgeon that I'd rather be deaf than blind. And he said, it doesn't work that way. And I was like, yeah, I realize it doesn't work that way. I'm just saying I'd rather be deaf than blind if I had a choice, which I realize I don't have. And then he said, well, the good news is that you won't be deaf. And I was like, thank you for explaining that my eye cancer isn't going to make me deaf. I feel so fortunate that an intellectual giant like yourself would deign to operate on me. <laughs> wow, he sounds like a winner, I said. I'm going to try to get me some eye cancer just so I can make this guy's acquaintance. Good luck with that. All right, I should go. Monica's waiting for me. I got to look at her a lot while I still can. Counterinsurgents tomorrow? Augustus asked. Definitely. Isaac turned and ran up the stairs, taking them two at a time. Augustus Waters turned to me. Literally, he said. Literally, I asked. We're literally in the heart of Jesus, he said. I thought we were in a church basement, but we are literally in the heart of Jesus. Someone should tell Jesus, I said. I mean, he's, it's got to be dangerous storing children with cancer in your heart. I would tell him myself, Augustus said, but unfortunately, I am literally stuck inside of his heart, so he won't be able to hear me. I laughed. He shook his head just looking at me. What? I asked. Nothing, he said. Why are you looking at me like that? Augustus half smiled. Because you're beautiful. I enjoy looking at beautiful people. And I decided a while ago not to deny myself the simple pleasures of existence. A brief, awkward silence ensued. Augustus plowed through. I mean, particularly given that, as you so deliciously pointed out, all of this will end in oblivion and everything. I kind of scoffed or sighed or exhaled in a way that was vaguely coffee. And then I said, I'm not beautiful. You are like millennial Natalie Portman, like the for vendetta Natalie Portman. I'd never seen it, I said. Really, he asked. Pixie-haired, gorgeous girl, dislikes authority and can't help but fall for a boy she knows is trouble? It's your autobiography, so far as I can tell. His every syllable flirted. Honestly, he kind of turned me on. I didn't even know that guys could turn me on, not like in real life. A younger girl walked past us. How's it going, Alyssa? He asked. She smiled and mumbled. Hi, Augustus. Memorial people, he explained. Memorial was the big research hospital. Where do you go? Children's, I said, my voice smaller than I expected it to be. He nodded. The conversation seemed over. Well, I said, nodding vaguely toward the steps that led us out of the little heart of Jesus. I tilted my cart onto its wheels and I started walking. He limped beside me. So see you next time, maybe? I had said. You should see it, he said. V for Vendetta, I mean. Okay, I said, I'll look it up. No, with me, at my house, he said. Now, I stopped walking. I hardly know you, Augustus Waters. You could be an axe murderer, he nodded. True enough, Hazel Grace. He walked past me, his shoulders filling out his green knit polo shirt, his back straight, his steps lilting just slightly to the right, as he walked steady and confident on what I determined was a prosthetic leg. Osteosarcoma sometimes takes a limb 
to check you out. Then, if it likes you, it takes the rest. I followed him upstairs, losing ground as I made my way up slowly, stairs not being a field of expertise for my lungs. And then we were out of the heart of Jesus and in the parking lot, the spring air just on the cold side of perfect, the late afternoon light heavenly in its hurtfulness. Mum wasn't there yet, which was unusual, because Mum was almost always waiting for me. I glanced around and I saw that a tall, curvy brunette had just pinned Isaac against the stone wall of the church, kissing him rather aggressively. They were close enough to me that I could hear the weird noises of their mouths together, and I could hear him say, always, and her saying, always, in return. Suddenly, standing next to me, Augustus half whispered, they're big believers in PDA. What's with the always? The slurping sounds intensified. Always is their thing. They'll always love each other and whatever. I would conservatively estimate that they have texted each other the word always four million times last year. A couple of more cars drove up, taking Michael and Alyssa away. It was just Augustus and me now watching Isaac and Monica, who proceeded apace as if they were not leaning against a place of worship. His hand reached for her breast over her shirt and pawed at it, his palm still while his fingers moved around. I wondered if that felt good. Didn't seem like it would, but I decided to give Isaac a pass on the grounds that he was going blind. The senses must feast while there is yet hunger and whatever. Imagine taking that last drive to the hospital, I said quietly. The last time you'll ever drive a car. Without looking over at me, Augustus said, You're killing my vibe here, Hazel Grace. I'm trying to observe young love in its many splendid awkwardness. I think he's hurting her boob, I said. Yes, it's difficult to ascertain whether he's trying to get her turned on or to perform a breast exam. Then Augustus Waters reached into a pocket and pulled out, of all things, a pack of cigarettes. He flipped it open and put a cigarette between his lips. Are you serious? I asked. You think that's cool? Oh my gosh, you just ruined the whole thing. Which whole thing? He asked, turning to me. The cigarette dangled unlit from the unsmiling corner of his mouth. The whole thing where a boy who is not unattractive or unintelligent or seemingly in any way unacceptable stares at me and points out incorrect uses of literality and compares me to an actress and asks me to watch a movie at his house. But of course there's always a harmadia and yours is that, oh my God, even though you had freaking cancer, you give money to a company in exchange for the chance to acquire yet more cancer. Oh my God, let me just assure you that not being able to breathe, it sucks. Totally disappointing, totally. Aha, uh -huh, Marsha, he asked, the cigarette still in his mouth. It tightened his jaw. He had a hell of a jawline, unfortunately. A fatal flaw, I explained turning away from him. I stepped toward the curb, leaving Augustus Waters behind me, and then I heard a car start down the street. It was Mom. She had been waiting for me to, I don't know, make a friend or whatever. I felt this weird mixture of disappointment and anger welling up inside me. I don't even know what the feeling was, really. Just that there was a lot of it. And I wanted to smack Augustus Waters. And also, replace my lungs with lungs that didn't suck at being lungs. I was standing with my Chuck Taylors on the very edge of the curb, the oxygen tank ball and chain in the cart by my side, and right as my mom pulled up, I felt a hand grab mine. I yanked my hand free, but turned back to him. They don't kill you unless you light them, he said, as mom arrived at the curb, and I've never lit one. It's a metaphor, you see? You're putting this killing thing right between your teeth but you don't give it the power to kill you. It's a metaphor? I said, dubious. Mom was just idling. It's a metaphor, he said. You choose your behaviors based on metaphorical resonances? I said, oh yes, he smiled. The big goofy real smile. 
I'm a big believer in metaphor, Hazel Grace. I turned to the car, tapped the window. It rolled down. I'm going to a movie with Augustus Waters, I said. Please record the next several episodes of ANTM Marathon for me. And that is the end. That is how this very famous couple met each other. Um, so, what happens in a story where it takes place in a support group for kids with cancer? You kind of need to go there. Someone's going to die. Who's going to die? What are they doing with their lives? And it's a, tr it's a tremendous it's a tremendous story and I believe that the author really captures a lot of the a lot of the feelings that people who are dying have and then the difficulty with choosing life and the difficulty with coping with dying when it repeatedly comes back to them but I also believe that the author wrote too much like an adult for these teenage um, characters. You, I feel like you could even tell from the chapter one. But it is so worth it, and you need to read this book, watch the movie, and I apologize for it being a little bit on the PG-13 side and how that might have made you feel awkward, so I'll make sure that I put a warning inside the description. And take care, everyone. See you next week. Thanks for watching.